My name is Brittany Quick Warner. I'm the president and CEO at the Eugene Area Chamber of Commerce. And we, um, in an attempt to try and get as many questions answered for our members and the community members that we've been talking to, uh, we launched this webinar series on Monday, Committed to Community. And we have a series of speakers that we're inviting in to just try and help answer questions that we're getting that, um, that we know that we're not the experts on, but we are, um, we are always here to convene experts to try and help answer those questions. So we've invited Amanda Walkup and Andy Lewis from Hershner Hunter Attorneys to join us today to talk a little bit about um, some of the legal implications of the rules that are coming down from the state, from the federal government. Um, there's been a series of um, a series of rules that have been released uh, relating to paid time off, relating to unemployment. Um, there's all kinds of things going on right now, and it is a moving target. We we initially scheduled this uh, webinar assuming that we would have had the federal stimulus package already passed. It is not passed yet. Um, the hope is that it will do, it will be passed today. So there's gonna be some questions that we thought we'd be able to answer by now that we are not able to. So we're gonna go ahead and schedule a follow-up webinar once that package is passed so we can get some of those questions answered too. So um, as I'm sure everybody is dealing with, it's a little bit of a moving target right now. Um, and there's constant information being passed down um, that we're trying to follow along with. So. I'm going to um, turn it over to Amanda and Andy, and they have a presentation that they want to give just to try and get as much information up front, and then we'll open it up for questions in the second portion of the webinar. So, Amanda and Andy, you guys are on. Okay, thanks, Brittany. Um, a couple of housekeeping matters first. When I talk, Amanda's face appears. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure I'll how. Try not to make that. <laughs> maybe maybe you put up the uh, um, the presentation and and that won't throw people off. But um, as far as housekeeping matters are concerned, um, first, Brittany's dead on. Uh, you know, this is a moving target. Things change by the hour. We were hoping we could talk a little bit about phase three of the of the stimulus package, which is the bill that's currently. Uh, being considered by the Senate has not yet been voted on. They haven't even published a summary of what it says. Uh, and so we know very little about it. Really all we know is what uh, we gather through press reports, which is essentially the same uh, resource that you have. And so unfortunately, we're not gonna have a lot to share about that aspect of uh, the dilemma that we're in. Um, so what we are going to talk about is uh, the governor's stay-at-home order, the two pieces of federal legislation uh, that have been passed and signed by the president and become effective uh, on April 1st. Um, and then we're going to talk about layoff considerations, COBRA, and the type of day-to-day -day, um, decisions that people are facing uh, now. Uh, before I get into the details, though, I do want to say that um, we are restricted by our ethical rules and our malpractice policy. We cannot provide um, legal advice in response to questions. We can address hypotheticals, um, but we cannot give direct legal advice in this presentation. Uh, so let's start by talking about, uh, and we're going to blow through this written presentation fairly quickly. Um, uh-oh. How do I make this full size? Does that work? Yeah. You see my... Yeah, you might have to scroll down just a little bit. Okay. Uh, we're going to start by talking about the governor's order. And like I said, we're going to rip through this um, outline fairly quickly so that we can get to questions and, and um, comments that people might have. So in talking about the governor's order, basically it went into effect um, yesterday and it's essentially a stay at home order that affects all individuals and businesses. Um, it also requires certain businesses to close. Keep going. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're both new at Zoom, so yeah. we appreciate your, your patience as Amanda gets this. There we go. Okay. So there are a, a specific um, list of businesses that have been ordered close effective yesterday. Uh, and the governor has the power to expand that list uh, whenever she chooses to do so. 
the closure order does not apply to um, restaurants, bars, cafes, and, and similar establishments, but they are limited to takeout. Those establishments are also subject to the other component of uh, the governor's order, and that is with respect to those retail establishments that remain open, uh, employers or business owners are obligated to establish uh, an individual within the company uh, responsible for creating and implementing and enforcing the social distancing rules that have been, or they're not rules, but guidelines that have been issued by the Oregon Health Authority. And we have provided the citation at the, at the bottom of this presentation uh, to the Oregon Health Authority social distancing guidelines so you can see what those say. Those guidelines won't apply to uh, medical facilities, um, rest, or, uh, uh, grocery stores, and other similar types of businesses. Um, so just be aware of that. Any retail business that does not comply with those guidelines is subject to closure until they do. So, so just to make sure we're clear, so keep in mind that if you are a retail business that's still allowed to operate, you do have to have a social distancing policy. So that's something that's new. You've got to have it. Probably need to be in writing, and then it needs to be follow. It needs to follow the guidance under the Oregon Health Authority. So just make sure you are, you understand that that's a new obligation that you have. Right, and and those restrictions uh, are effective immediately. So if you don't have a policy, contact your attorney, and uh, we're we're working on one as we speak. Um, okay, and then there are other restrictions that apply to all businesses, not just re retail establishments. And actually, before I get to this list, um, it, the governor has not defined what a retail establishment is. But, you know, if you look at the list on the prior page, um, you'll get a pretty good idea of what they have in mind. Now, with respect to the workplace restrictions that apply to all workplaces, Amanda, if you could scroll back to that. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, basically, if you are a business that has the ability to permit employees to work from home, then you have an obligation to do so. And the question then becomes, well, what does it mean to have the ability to to allow them to work from home. And the governor's order basically says, when you're making that determination, you have to consider their duties, um, the availability of teleworking equipment, and whether or not the internet or other network is capable of permitting telework. If you're not able to accommodate telework, then those employees who are required to be at the office or at work are still required to comply with the Oregon Health Authority's um, social distancing guidelines. Now, a violation of the governor's order is a crime. Um, I suspect that it's the Oregon State Police that enforces this order. It's hard to say the extent to which they've got the capacity to even pay attention to it. Um, but just be aware that there are um, there are consequences if you fail to comply. And there are, you know, we get a lot of calls from employers who have employees who are uh, quite concerned about whether or not the employer is complying uh, with the order. So employees are taking it seriously, as should employers. Okay, we're gonna move on, talk quickly. So one more thing, so just as with retail business, if you are open for business and you're not a retail company, you still have to have a policy, a written policy about social distancing, you've got to establish a person. So just as with retail business, you've got that obligation. So make sure you've got that in place. Yeah, good point. Okay, we're going to move on. We're going to talk to the federal legislation that did pass. Um, and I'm assuming through this process that you'll have access to this document that we're, that's in front of you. But I do want to make a correction. Uh, we got guidance from the Department of Labor this morning uh, and the Department of Labor's view is that the law becomes effective on April 1st, not April 2nd. Uh, so just make that correction if you have access to this document and, and print it out. Everything I'm about to talk about becomes effective on April 1st. 
So there are two components to the federal legislation that are important for employers to know. The first is that there is an expansion of the Federal Family and Medical Leave Act to provide 12 weeks of leave for an employee who is a unable to either work or telework because they have a minor child who is at home because their school or their daycare facility has closed. Uh, that law becomes effective on April 1st. Now, I mentioned 12 weeks of leave. 10 weeks of that leave is going to be paid. The first 10 days are not paid, but we're going to talk about how they could be paid in a minute. Um, the, the rate of pay for the second section of this, the 10 weeks that is paid, is going to be two-thirds of the employee's regular rate of pay, but it's capped at $200 per day and $10,000 in the aggregate. There is a requirement in this law that employees who are out on childcare leave, for lack of a better description, uh, are entitled to their job back, but there is an exception for employers with 25 or less employees. But to meet that exception, they have to, that employer has to follow certain requirements. Um, there is a provision in the bill that permits employers with 50 or, or I'm sorry, with less than 50 employees to seek a hardship exemption. And we were looking for guidance from the Department of Labor as to what that actually means, how they do it. And what we've seen so far from the Department of Labor is that you don't make any kind of application. You just self-elect to be exempt and then you um, you document as best you can the reasons for that. The one thing I'll add though, based on the guidance that came out last night is they are going to develop a program or better, better guidelines than that. So stay tuned. So don't assume that just because you've got fewer than 50, you're gonna automatically fit. And in fact, the statute itself has a very specific term. You have to prove that the imposition of the paid leave would jeopardize the viability of the business as a going concern, which to me sounds like a cash flow problem. If I were to do the outlay of this cash, it's going to jeopardize the viability of my business as a going concern. So that's a pretty tight, pretty narrow uh, exception. And the other thing to keep in mind, these money that we're talking about, you do get reimbursed for it. So it's not as though you're out the money in total. It's just that you are paying it in advance and then the government is going to turn around and give you the opportunity to get repaid. So, so therefore, for these reasons, I, I would be very um, hesitant to automatically jump into the exemption bandwagon and maybe stay tuned until we get better guidance from the Department of Labor before you can, screw, before you can evaluate whether or not you fit. Yeah, and what we're hearing from the IRS is that you get reimbursed at 100% of what you pay out. Well, up to the caps. Up to the caps, right. Um, but, I mean, yeah, people aren't going to pay more than the cap. Some but, people have offered, but yeah. Okay. So in any case, uh, you get reimbursed at 100% up to the caps, um, and those reimbursements are in the form of tax credits and tax refunds. Our understanding is that the tax credit process is going to be fairly quick, uh, no less often than quarterly, I think. No, the tax refund is every pay, every payroll. Okay, every payroll. Every payroll, you'll have a chance to, and we'll get into that, but... So, so the timing of how you get your money back is fluid, but it should be within the two months based off of what the IRS guidelines are, are issuing. Yeah, definitely yeah. something you'd want to talk with your accountant about. Um, but again, you know, we're not getting a lot of, of information from the agencies yet. They're frantically drafting the rules that are going to apply. Um, okay, another important exception for those on the, on the chat that are healthcare providers, there is uh, the ability of a healthcare employer to exempt out healthcare providers and emergency responders. Now, we have no idea what the scope of that exemption is. My suspicion is that what's driving it is they want people who provide direct patient care to be available to provide healthcare needs, and this exemption is therefore not going to apply for example, to the people in your billing department. Um, but we don't know that. It's quite possible it'll be broader. Um, we just don't know. 
And we anticipate that whatever regulations are going to be issued will certainly be issued before April 1st. But uh, if what's going to happen is aligned with what we've experienced before, you're probably going to get those guidelines on March 31st. Okay. Unfortunately, it's just the way it works. Okay, so that's the that's the expansion of the um, Federal Family and Medical Leave Act. The second aspect of the federal law that we wanted to touch on is the Emergency Paid, C Paid Sick Leave Act. Um, that, like the expansion of the Federal Family Medical Leave Act, applies to employers with between one and 499 employees. And again, uh, make the correction on the document, it's April 1st, not April 2nd, that's the effective date. And unlike the, the expansion of the Family and Medical Leave Act, uh, that requires employees to be employed for a period of 30 days, this provision allows employees to, to gain coverage um, immediately. So if they are on your payroll on April 1st, they are entitled to paid sick leave under this provision. Now, they're entitled to two weeks of paid sick leave for the purposes that are outlined in the document uh, a through F. It's broader than the family leave expansion. It does include required, being required to stay home because you have a child who's out of school or daycare, but it also applies to situations where an employee or a family member of the employee is uh, experiencing coronavirus-related symptoms um, or conditions. Now, I mentioned that <clears throat> it's paid leave. The, the amount of the pay depends on whether or not you're subject to items A through C or D through F. Um, but in any event, the extent of the paid leave is 80 hours. And so the best way to look at this is, as I mentioned before, you've got a new law requiring 12 weeks of leave for childcare, 10 of which is paid, two of, weeks is un two of which is unpaid. Under this bill, though, those first two weeks of childcare leave can be paid. But again, this particular aspect of the law is broader than the family leave portion, so they are going to get two weeks of paid sick leave for a variety of different purposes, not just uh, having a, a child at home. The, the leave for uh, situations where the employee is the one affected by coronavirus is going to be their regular rate of pay, which includes bonuses and commissions and that sort of thing. Um, but it doesn't exceed $511 per day and a total of $5,110 in the aggregate. If it's because they, are, they need to be gone because a child is at home or they're caring for a family member, the rate of pay is different. It's 200, the cap is $200. It's still their regular rate of pay, but it's capped at $200 per day and $2,000 in the aggregate. Now, paid, a lot of employers have uh, their own paid sick leave policies or paid time off policies. This paid sick leave is in addition to that. And in addition, this paid sick leave takes priority over other sick leave, but it's all up to the employee. So the employee gets to decide, I want to use my federal paid sick leave first, or I want to use my PTO first. As with the paid leave under the family leave expansion, this sick leave is reimbursable under the same structure that Amanda and I were talking about earlier, where you get uh, tax credits and refunds. Um, there's also a hardship exemption for this particular um, type of leave, but it is limited to leave for childcare purposes. So smaller employers are not going to be able to get an exemption if the employee uh, has COVID-19 and requires sick leave on that basis. So there's a question somebody asked, if, they, if you have furloughed your employees, are you going to be required to pay these 80 hours? And first of all, the use of the term furlough is something that we, is, uh, it's not really a defined term. So 
can we just walk through that really quick? The layoff versus the furlough versus they're still employed. Sure. So if you have already laid off your employees prior to April 1st, then as we understand the law, you are not required to offer this leave because they do not work for you anymore. Which is the nature of a layoff. So just, just yes. to introduce a point, the term layoff and the term furlough are not legally defined terms. So we rely on the conventional use of those two words. And conventionally, a layoff is a termination. And a furlough is the continuation of an employee's employment. They're just not at work putting in the hours. So that's, that's the fundamental distinction between the two. And so because the person was laid off, they were terminated, they got a final paycheck, you cashed them out of whatever accrued leave if you're required to do so under your policy, they're gone, they're on unemployment. If you have group health, they're on COBRA. So that's what that looks like. And if you have done that, then no, these folks are not eligible for this paid leave program. So secondly, if you furloughed them, that means there was no termination, there was no final paycheck, you have not cashed them out of their PTO, they're still eligible to make use of your company offered leave. They may still be on your group health plan, if that's the world you're in, then um, the answer to this is not clear, but probably not, because what you're doing is you're paying these folks based off of their normal work schedule. We don't know what normal work schedule means, but there's an argument that normal work schedule means whatever is on the schedule for this week. Because I'm furloughed, I'm not working, so therefore I have no hours that I've lost. So if you're doing a furlough in that regard, then no, you don't have to pay them. Amanda. On the other hand, if, if you dropped hours, but they're still working for you, then they're still your employees. They still have hours on the books, hours on the schedule. So then, yes, you would be having to pay them. Hey, Amanda, I have a question then on the furlough, I guess, technicality. So if someone, say someone was told they're being furloughed, they're maintaining their health benefits, but they don't have any working hours, are they eligible to apply for unemployment? Yes. Okay. Unemployment is based off of hours, not based off of your employment status. You can still be employed, your hours drop, let's say 60%, 40%. Um, unemployment, they have a scale of how much they're looking at for the deduction or the reduction in your income or hours. Okay. But as long as you reduce hours at all, you're still eligible for unemployment, regardless of termination, furlough, laid off, still working, any of that. Okay. Amanda, can you expand? Can you just... Um enhance the screen a little bit some people are having a hard time reading the. i don't know how to do that you if you can just zoom in just zoom in yeah there you go make it bigger or smaller bigger, bigger. so yeah so can you go to like 100 percent maybe yeah there we go yeah okay so that's that would be who's eligible for the leave um if you want to make your employees eligible and a lot of employers do because this is kind of free money from the federal government, you are having the cash flow. And I see on here, somebody indicates that sometimes cash flow could be problematic. Absolutely. But if you have the cash flow, you may want to offer this paid leave to your employees because you're going to be refunded back um, all the money that you've spent. So long as you are honoring the cap. Okay. Okay. Um, so, just a couple other points on the paid sick leave. There is the health care provider uh, exemption, just like uh, with the expansion of the, of the federal medical leave. Um, the, the difference between the federal medical leave and the paid sick leave is there is a notice that employers are going to be required to post on April 1st, the effective date, specifying the elements of this benefit. Uh, the Department of Labor is apparently putting that together. They don't have it yet, but they promise they will. As of today, they said in their um, information out last night that they would have it available today. For medical so leave, that's a and the paid sick of labor is, there is a notice that employers are going to be required to post on April 1st the effective date specifying the elements of this benefit. Uh, the Department of Labor is apparently putting that together. They don't have it yet, but they promise they will. As of today, they said in their um, information out last night that they would have it available today. For so medical leave, the, the paid sick of labor is, there is a notice that employers are going to be required to post 
on April 1st, the effective date, specifying the elements of this benefit. Uh, the Department of Labor is apparently putting that together. They don't have it yet, but they promise they will. As of today, they said in their um, information out last the night that they would have it available today. So the, 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 the patient the labor is, there is a notice employers are going to be required to post. Sorry, got it. <laughs> okay, thanks. Whew. Okay. I was scared, fighting. All right, so there's one last thing that I want to talk about, and then Amanda can talk more about uh, furloughs and layoffs. The, another thing we saw recently from uh, BOLI, the Oregon Bureau of Labor and Industries, is uh, an emergency rule that expands the scope of OFLA, so Oregon's version of FEMLA, which typically applies to uh, employers with 25 or more employees. Uh, an expansion of coverage under sick child leave to include care for a child who is home from school or a daycare facility as a result of the governor's orders. Uh, and so that only applies to employers who are subject to OFLA, um, but it is an expansion of sick child leave. And for those uh, on the call who who don't know anything about FEMLA, this is going to be a challenge for you. So you, there may be some smaller employers who have never been subject to FEMLA because FEMLA typically applies to employers with 50 or more employees. Uh, and now suddenly we have the federal government saying, look, you've got, um, you've got obligations under FEMLA because we've expanded it to include childcare and we've expanded it to include employers of one or more employees. And when they say it's part of FEMLA, that means you have to comply with all the FEMLA notice requirements. Um, there are some verification rights you've got. Um, so it's tricky. And, and my best advice is, if you don't know anything about FEMLA, you should be talking with your employment attorney to make sure that you're complying with that statute, um, given the breadth of this new bill. One more thing I want to cover there's, um, of, the, of the questions we received, just going back to this overlay of paid time versus the time that you have offered through privately. So let me back up. We've got the federal paid leave, both the FMLA expansion, and then also the paid sick leave, both of which Andy just talked about. And then you've got your private PTO, vacation sick, whatever you may be offering your employees. And like Andy said, that all of those, if, if the people qualify, they would get their federal paid leave on top of their original paid leave, whatever you're offering them privately. Um, if you are reducing hours, can you require them to use their own personal PTO? And the answer to that is probably yes. It would depend on what your policy is, but if that is the way you want them to make up those hours, then yes, they could do that. If they were to do that though, that could eliminate or minimize their eligibility for unemployment because then they have their, cat, their income has not dropped and so then they, um, from unemployment perspective, they're not, they're, they're still whole, so there's no loss there that they would need to make up. Okay. So then moving on, layoffs versus furloughs. And we've already covered the basic differences. The layoff is a final paycheck. You are obligated to pay out accrued leave if your policies require it. Um, this is a common mistake that employers make, and it could be, have very bad consequences because if you do not pay out unused PTO or vacation and your policy requires you to do so, then that is an, a wage claim. You fail to pay all compensation due. So if that is your obligation, then you need to make sure you do that or there could be a wage claim later on. Hey, Amanda, on if that- you offer group- Yeah? On that topic, someone asked, um, just so we don't lose track of it, so for a lot of these restaurants that got closed last week, a lot of folks um, or hotels or whatever, they laid folks off last week and they paid out all of those obligations. Is there any relief that you've heard of coming for employers who had to do that? The, the only relief that I'm aware of would be what's coming out of the stimulus package now. And it could be either cash relief or through the SBA loan program. But th that's it. We don't know of anything. I, I don't know of anything yet. Okay. No, and I, I would be surprised if if the bill goes as far as saying, if you've paid out PTO 
for example, we're going to reimburse you for PTO you've paid you've paid out. Yeah, I but I don't know. Hard to say. Hard to say. No one, it's a thousand pages long, and no one knows what's in it. Okay, thank you. But hopefully, there's something out there for those folks. Um, if if you offer group health insurance, don't lose sight of that. If you're going to lay a person off, that means you're terminating them. That will trigger COBRA. If you have more than 20 employee, 20 or more employees, it will trigger small business continuation if you have fewer than 20 employees. Again, the furlough is it's more of an unpaid leave of absence than a termination. Folks remain on the payroll. They're allowed to use their accrued leave. Um, if you have group health plans, keep in mind that the vast majority of them have some sort of minimum working requirement. So I need to work, for example, 25 hours per week in order to be eligible for my group health plan. If you are going to furlough people or even reduce their hours, and you know that the result is they're going to fall below those minimum hour requirements, you need to check with your insurance carrier. There are some carriers that are now giving a 90-day grace period so you can keep these folks on your group health plan even though they're not technically eligible for coverage. But that is something that your carrier has to do. You cannot do that on your own. And if you do that, if you do have that right, then you may want to take advantage of it if you can afford to continue paying your health insurance premiums. If you cannot afford to continue paying health insurance premiums, then you would just go ahead and trigger the COBRA. The person's not eligible for coverage because they're working below the minimum hours and then they'd be on COBRA, and then at that point, they'd be on the hook for their own insurance premium. The other thing we can point out is if that's your reality, you still want to pay some amount to help your, your uh, employees cover their COBRA premiums, but you're not able to pay the full amount, talk with your employment attorney because there are some opportunities for that. So you could do a, some sort of a premium uh, sharing where I would pay 50% of the premium and my employee would pay 50% of the premium but you're gonna to need to have something like that in writing. Um, unemployment benefits, we've already talked about that. That's more focused on hours lost or money lost, not based off of whether you're working or not. So feel free to file for unemployment if you feel you're eligible. If you're not eligible, they'll reject you, but you might as well try it. Um, Self-employed individuals historically have not been eligible for unemployment tax or unemployment benefits. However, both in the state of Oregon and my understanding under the stimulus package, so on the federal side, that's actually going to change. I don't know if the state has made that decision yet, but it's up for discussion. But, I, but based off the press release on the federal side, that has been decided. So again, if you are a self-employed individual, um, you might, might as well apply. Where the worst thing is they'll tell you you're not eligible. For those of you that are thinking about reducing hours, so you're not going to drop me all the way down to zero, but you're going to take me from 40 hours to 25 hours or something like that. There is a great program through WorkShare Oregon. You should sign up for it. You don't have to qualify. All you have to do is register. And what they will do is help get your employees more money than they would get otherwise if they went through the ordinary unemployment. So if you are reducing hours, WorkShare Oregon is a great resource. And I want to I want to emphasize the employer is the one who signs up through WorkShare Oregon. So unemployment obviously is the employee who signs up, but WorkShare Oregon has to be the employer that signs up for it. Correct. So get on that. If that, if that is your reality, either currently or in the future, you should sign up for it sooner rather than later. COBRA, we've already talked about that. You're eligible for it if you are um, no longer working. So if the employer has, uh, you're, you either have been laid off, so you've been terminated, or your hours have dropped below the minimum hours, you would be eligible for COBRA or small business continuation. If you are an employer in that, in that boat, you do have notice requirements. So you need to make sure that you are sending out the notices. If you don't know what I'm talking about, talk to your insurance carrier because there are requirements and they have deadlines and you don't want to miss it. And I think that that's it. We also had, and I've lost it again, shoot. We also have something in here on the WARN Act. We're not gonna spend any time on it, but that is a federal law that, um, I'm just gonna stop sharing. It's a federal law that affects employers who are going, who have at least 100 employees. 
So if you have at least 100 employees and you are looking at a mass layoff or shutting down, you need to make sure that you've complied with the WARN Act. That'll be on our written materials. We're not going to cover it now. Okay. So with that, do you want to just go through some of these questions? Sure. Yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna go through and, and kind of try to get the ones asked that have not already been touched on. Um, and... And obviously there's some of these questions that we might not know the answers to yet. So um, if you're asking one of those, we apologize, but we're, we're keeping track of all these questions and we have a running document that we're trying to go back and get answers to um, and rolling them over to future um, webinars as more information comes out. So, um, so let's see here. And some of these were asked while you were in the middle of some of these conversations. So if, if the question's not totally complete, I'll, I'll let you guys chime back in. Um, fitness clubs were asked to be closed, but a lot of them have moved to online. Um, is there, I mean, do we see any reason that that's not okay? Well, the, I think the online presentation, the online would be fine. The, the point of the order was that you not have social contact. Um, so in essence, you've kind of changed your model from being a fitness club to being an online exercise membership subscription or something like that. So I, I would argue, again, this is all up subject to interpretation, but I think it'd be safe to say that that's not going to be forbidden or prohibited under the governor's order. Yeah, it seems to me that the purpose of the order was to eliminate contact between um, employees and customers. And if that's been accomplished, I think it would be hard for them to argue that a fitness club has to close down entirely. In other words, stop providing online courses that people have access to from their homes. Yeah. So um, another question, which I think there's a couple of versions of this. So I'm going to try to um, get to the heart of it. So a lot of employers are in this place right now where they're trying to make decisions right now on what they should be doing. Some of these um, FMLA and um, OFLA rules don't go into effect till April 1st. What do we do in the middle time period should employers try to make full payroll by the end of this month so they can keep those employees on and then take advantage of those benefits that happen april 1st the in-between phase i think is what's really confusing folks and giving them a lot of anxiety yeah we were just talking about this before we started you know so if you are in the position where you've already laid somebody off um so we'll start with that can you rehire them on april 1st and have them be eligible for benefits and i don't see why you couldn't the, that, that segment of the leave, the paid, was it emergency paid sick leave act, has a immediate eligibility. So there's no waiting period. So if you hire somebody on April 1st and you've got them on your payroll and you've got them, they would otherwise be scheduled to work, um, then they would be eligible for the up to two or the two weeks up to 80 hours of paid leave. Um, so if that is something that you are interested in and you have the ability to front that cash, I think that that's a benefit you could offer your employees. It's a complicated question because it, it brings in, I mean, essentially it's a cash, cash flow issue. So it implicates your existing paid leave policies and the extent to which you're required to pay out paid leave on termination. Mm -hmm. um, it implicates uh, your ability to front pay, for example, for those who take advantage of the new federal legislation uh, and take say, you know, childcare leave for up to 12 weeks, you know you're going to get reimbursed for that money, um, but it is not going to be immediate. And so, frankly, a lot of employers are, are looking at their reserves and their revenue and making hard decisions. Can I afford to have somebody on my payroll uh, or am I better off laying them off at least giving them the benefit of unemployment compensation. And when the time comes, hopefully we'll be in a position to bring them back. So there's no real easy answer to the question. The only other thing I'd add is under the, what we've been told is in the federal stimulus bill is an enhancement of the unemployment benefit. So before uh, unemployment, it's something, but it's not very much for some individuals. So this would at least give them more money if they were to qualify for unemployment. So, so if you are in that position where you simply cannot afford to keep your folks going, which is a lot of situation, I mean, a lot of employers have that, at least you can be comforted in knowing that the unemployment benefit will be more than what it was. 
Yeah, and in the new bill that the Senate is supposed to vote on today, we know that there are going to be uh, small business loans or grants made available. Um, and as far as we can tell, it's not just, and they're not small, they're up to five, five million. That's what I read, $5 million. Um, and, and there's a provision in there from what I've read that in order for those grants to be forgiven, you can't lay off employees. You have to keep them employed. And so we've had some employers saying, well, will that, will we be able to get a small business loan if we've laid off employees or furloughed employees prior to April 1st or the effective date of that bill, which might yeah. be different. And we don't know the answer to that. Okay. But my guess is that you're not going to be punished if you've had to make immediate decisions that predated your access to these small business loan or small business administration loans and grants. And the other thing is it's being done today and tomorrow. So by Monday, we should know the answers or at least to the extent that they've been clear in the bill. So we someone, don't know it today. Yeah. Okay. So someone, um, and I, I think you, what you said is you're not really sure when, when do you get reimbursed? Cause folks who are dealing with cash flow issues or. Yeah. So, you know, the guidance from the IRS, which came out last Friday, um, it basically there's two ways you're going to get reimbursed. One is in the payroll itself. So you would historically, you do have to deduct federal income tax from all of your employees. Plus there's a FICA component that the employee and the employer pay. So that would be your federal tax deposit that you would then turn around and deposit with the IRS. So you would be able to retain the full amount of that or up to the amount of your credit. So that's the first way you get paid back. And, and some of you may get paid back in full, um, some of you may not. And so if there's still a balance owing from that pay period, then the IRS is currently developing a refund program, which they're supposed to roll out this week, which would include a form, I'm assuming it's all online, but then you would submit a request for reimbursement or refund from the IRS. What they've said in their material, they put this in print, that they expect that it would issue a refund within two weeks. Now, I'm a little bit skeptical that they're gonna be able to pull that off. So, but you should be able to get it back maybe within, you know, count on two months. So you'll get some immediate money back from that federal deposit that you withheld up to the credit. And then if you have any additional credit to do, you would submit for a refund and then the IRS would do a refund. And you would do that for each pay period that you have these folks on this subsidized paid leave program. So someone asked, can we pull back federal payroll taxes now in anticipation of those benefit payments going to our employees post April 2nd? That is not clear. They used the word effective immediately in their guidance that they issued on the 20th, but I don't know that that's gonna be valid because you don't have a tax credit yet. You only have a tax credit once you've paid the money to these individuals on the protected leave. So I would not do it, well, we're not giving you advice, but I would tell you, you only get to do the tax credit up to the amount you have a tax credit. You don't have one yet. You won't have one until April 1st. Okay. Um, is 80 hours of paid sick leave in addition to the 40 hours that we are required to provide now in Oregon? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, if we furlough employees, are we required to pay the 80 hours of sick leave? You answered that. The answer is no, because it's paid based on the, the hours that they're on the schedule, right? We, it's based off of the hours they would normally work. We don't know what that normally works means. So I, I think a conservative reading to that is no, but if you wanted to continue to pay them, you could do that too. Okay. Um, is the new Sick Leave Act also effective April 1st? Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, is there any assist? Well, we already asked this one. If there's any assistance for companies who had to pay the sick and vacation time due to layoffs, and we don't, we're not totally aware of that right now. Um, let's see. We will be sending. Uh, assuming it's okay with you guys, we will be sending the document out that you were referring to um, for folks, and we'll post it on our website as well. Um, someone says we are a retail dealership and are in a gray area. We're considered retail, but not defined as crucial or non-crucial. Have you heard anything more regarding dealerships? So we aren't sure if we need to pay no. off or furlough or what? 
Yeah, we haven't we haven't heard anything. I mean, it's difficult. We're getting a lot of questions about whether or not a particular establishment is a retail establishment. Um, and unfortunately, the only guidance we have is the governor's order. Um, so, so I, I to say. yeah, I can chime in that there are a handful of business groups, um, our Eugene Chamber included, that are pushing on the governor for a little bit more clarification for some of these. So we'll put the dealerships on the list that folks are having questions about. And if we are able to get them answered, we'll definitely send that information out. So someone says, if LLC owners are on salary, are they eligible um, for the additional 80 hours of paid reimbursable sick leave? So the way the paid sick leave law is defined, they define an employee as somebody who is employed by an employer. So in many situations with an LLC, um, owners of the LLC are also drawing a salary because they are providing services and receiving compensation in return. Mm -hmm. So to that extent, I would say yes, that, that if you are an employee of the LLC, then you are entitled to the benefits of those protections. Okay. Um, someone said, we weren't sure if we were required to close, so we've opted to stay open until we receive confirmation. I don't know if, if you're not giving advice, hypothetically, what you might say about that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think if you're on the list, that the, the long list that we showed at the beginning, it's very clear you need to close. Um, if you think that you've got a good argument that you fit into the definition of other retail businesses and you're not one of those on the list, you know, I don't know. And like Andy said, I don't know how strict they're going to be in, with enforcement. Um, what, what I have heard is that is the approach that the state is taking currently is to educate, not punish. And so if you're one of those businesses in the gray area, then I think there's some assurance from the state at this point anyway, that they're not going to arrest you and shut your business down yeah. uh, without further clarification as to whether or not you're covered. Yeah. I've also heard the same thing that they're, you know, they're enforcing with a warning first. And so if someone, if, if you're open and someone comes and says, Hey, you need to close, you at least have that time to do that um, before they might have any kind of, um, I guess, legal uh, recourse. Um, someone says, if the staff person is using FMLA, are they still eligible for your health insurance? The answer to that is yes. So if somebody is subject to FMLA, then an employer is obligated to maintain their health, health insurance during that period. Okay. Um, covering self-employee who are still working, but for less. Wasn't a complete question. So self, yeah, for self-employed individuals, um, similar to independent contractors, there's not a lot of guidance that we have on those categories we do we've heard that uh, for unemployment that they will be eligible the programs that we've talked about both of the paid sick leave program so the sick leave program and the fmla expansion program do not in the definition of employee include independent contractors um, or those that are self-employed so it's unclear whether or not you would be eligible for this leave Okay. And can someone take advantage of both the um, paid sick leave and the FMLA? Like, can you, like, can you do 10 weeks of one and then the 80 hours of the other on top of it or concurrently? Not concurrently. Yeah. So the, the way it, the way it works is remember that, that the expansion of the family leave only applies to uh, employees who are home because of a school closure or a child or a daycare center closure. So there is overlap with the paid sick leave law to that extent because the paid sick leave law also covers that circumstance. Mm -hmm. And so if some, if an employee comes to an employer and says, I need to be after April 1st or April 1st or after and says, I need to be at home and I can't telework because I have a minor child whose school has closed then they are entitled to two weeks of paid sick leave, the 80 hours of paid sick leave, 
under the paid sick leave law, followed by an additional 10 weeks of paid leave under the family leave law for a total of 12 weeks, essentially, of paid leave. Okay. Um, can, I just, can I just do one thing on that? Yeah. What is your understanding? If I am otherwise able to work from home, but I have a minor child, I think that that person is not going to be eligible for leave because my minor child is not relevant. It's the fact that I've got the infrastructure, so I've got the computer, the internet, the ability to work from home. I think that that would disqualify you. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, the, the statute is explicit. It says if you are unable to work or telework, uh, then you are entitled to the benefits of the statute. So I don't think you could say I've got a 10 month old at home and the distraction would make me unable to work. I don't think that that's the key as to whether or not you're able to work. Do you agree with that or do we know that? We may not know that. No, we, but yeah, I don't think we know that. There is a practical component to this though, and, and that is, you know, if you've got that situation and you're requiring somebody to telework, you're probably not gonna have somebody who has, is as productive. Yeah, <laughs> there's that. I, <laughs> I actually have a personal, yeah, personally, I have a couple of staff yeah. who are at home just kind of like, they're doing their best that they can, but they've got small kiddos who are, you know, obviously very demanding of their time and attention. Can you, can you do partial? So say I have a staff who's like, I feel confident I can get five solid hours of work. It might be cut between, you know, snack time and naps and all of that, but I could do five hours of solid work. Could we then supplement those other three hours, say a day with these leave options? So we think the answer to that is yes. We do. <laughs> well, on the family leave piece, yeah, I mean, again, so, so welcome to our world where we debate these unclear um, aspects of the law all the time. But when, when this bill was initially proposed in the House, it required this type of leave to be single segment. So, you know, it was all or nothing. But that language was removed from the final bill. And so at least with respect to the family leave piece, under the Federal Family and Medical Leave Act, in a lot of cases, intermittent and reduced schedule leave is permitted. Right. So it's coming back to me now. I remember this conversation just yesterday. Yeah. So, so <laughs> if I were were a guess, guess. <laughs> it is a guess that that people would be able to take child care leave intermittently. Okay. Not any of probably not the other ones, but child care. You probably yeah, I agree with that. Okay. Um, Mike asks, are the 80 hours available to the staffing agencies for temp hire staff as well? Um, I think the answer to that is yes. We're, we're getting more guidance from the Department of Labor, but when they look at an eligible employee, it appears that they mean anybody on your payroll or anybody on a staffing company's payroll that is working for you but that has not yet been solidified. What we do know is if a, temp a, if a temp employee ultimately gets hired by the employer, then for purposes of the 30 day requirement under the FMLA expansion, you would do a look back for all the hours that that employee worked both as a temp and then after the employee gets hired permanently. So that does indicate that they're wanting to double up on the employer both as a temp and a permanent okay so it doesn't fully answer the question but it kind of shows you where they're headed yeah um and someone wanted a little clarification on the question that i asked um so say i have a staff person that i'm going to cut back to five hours a day with three hours of um the fmla use not that the fmla but the well, it could be the FMLA, but also the paid sick leave. Or the paid sick leave. Those hours are paid out at two thirds their regular salary. Okay. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Well, so I guess, let me clarify that. So I could pay them their full amount, but I would only get reimbursed for two thirds of it. You're right. That's a perfect example. So there are caps, right? So the, the rule has certain limits. Um, they're only get you only get two thirds. You only get I think it's two hundred dollars a day, or there's there's these numbers that are out there. Employers are free to go above that, 
but when it comes to the reimbursement and the tax credit that you'd have, you are limited in the tax credit to the amount that the law allowed. allowed. Okay. Yeah, so the bill, the bill basically says you must pay your employee at least two-thirds of their regular rate. Okay. And I guess I'm asking a follow-up for the folks out there. Well, I don't know if you're using a payroll company or if you're doing it internally. What is the, tr like, how are we tracking all of this? What is, you know, what advice would you have for folks on making sure that if it comes back around, they have all the right documentation. I've been suggesting to clients that you develop a new pay code, however it is you manage your payroll, so that way you would know when is this individual on the federally subsidized or federal mandated paid sick program, when is this person actually working, and when is this person on a private, the employer provided PTO sick vacation time. Okay. Because ultimately, you're going to have to be able to prove your tax credit and your tax credits are going to be limited to only those amounts you paid out under the FMLA expansion or the paid sick leave act. Okay, thank you. And I would go one step further and I would break out between the federal expanded family leave, which is the child care piece, and other types of paid sick leave under, under federal law because that category is broader. Right. Um. All right, we got lots of questions in a couple different places, so I want to try to not miss any. Um, and it is 12.58, so I hope you guys are okay with going a little bit longer. Yeah, we, yeah, we can, yeah. Five or ten minutes more is fine. Okay. Um, let's see. Is WorkShare, so the WorkShare program through Oregon, there was a question on Monday and a follow-up here. Um, does that apply for all employees, or is it only applied to specific classifications of staff? We had someone say that they thought it wasn't, el like, exempt staff weren't eligible for the work share. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, okay. that'd, be a, that'd be a question for them. So, Ron, I see that you asked that. We're going to, we'll go ahead and give a call to the state to find out the answer to that, because we had that same question on Monday. So, we'll circle up as our, our chamber staff will look into that one. Um, someone asked, are manufacturers exempt from the work from home mandate in regards to office workers? So um, we have had a couple folks from um, employees from, um, from manufacturing companies who are office staff. They, they seem to think they have the ability to work from home, the equipment and whatnot, but the employers are still saying that they have to come in. Right, so, so that aspect of the governor's order says that if you are not a retail establishment, if you're any other type of employer, well, it, I guess it does include retail establishments, essentially any employer who has the ability to allow employees to work from home must allow them to work from home. So the question becomes, given their job duties uh, and responsibilities, the internet connectivity and other resources, is it feasible for them to work from home? And that's where the debate is. Yeah. And it's a case by case analysis. So for employers who, <laughs> who are trying to make that decision, um, I think for health purposes, we would recommend just trying to make the work from home thing work. Um, but you're saying that there is a little bit of, um, it, it's a little bit left up to interpretation, I guess, on if feasible or not. Yeah, I mean, to give you a real life example, our office is a basically closed and we're all working from home. But we have a couple of employees who live in the country with extremely poor internet connectivity and they simply cannot do the job from home. So for them, it's a, or for us, it's a fairly easy determination that if, they're, if we're going to enable them to work and they can't do it from home, then they can come into work and work in the office but they have to respect the OHA guidelines. Okay. And the only other thing I'd like to add is from employer's perspective, just because you're gonna say that we've never done it before, I'm not sure that's gonna be the right standard. Uh, the governor says to the maximum extent possible. So even though you're gonna to have to think outside the box, you may need to be looking at resources and opportunities that you have. So don't assume that just because you've never done it, that you're outside of that requirement. It's maximum extent possible that's the standard we're going to be held against yeah um let's see I'm trying to make sure i got all the ones on this chat a single member llc owner is not considered an employee and takes an owner's draw so are we considered for the coverage so 
we no. are considered. No. Now, if you're not an employee, employee, this, so these benefits we've been talking about apply to employees. Okay. And if you're not an employee, then you're not entitled to the benefit. Okay. Okay. Let's you see. may, th that may come in under the unemployment for purposes of the independent contractor and it has, they expand that entitlement. But as it's these benefits, these two paid leave programs, no. Someone asked, um, because it'll take a while to get back up and running, um, this is a restaurant owner, are we required to rehire all of our employees at once or can we do it in phases? If they're laid off, they're, it's, you're essentially starting from scratch, am I right? That is right. Okay. Yeah, there are no, now, yeah, I mean, they're, they're basically, I mean, this is private sector, so there are no um, priority rules that apply if you've terminated an employment relationship and then later decide to rehire employees. There's always a risk uh, that if you're going to select certain employees over others for rehire, that those decisions are based on prohibited, you know, legally prohibited criteria. Like I'm only going to rehire all the men. Uh, that's going to be problematic. But in terms of just sequencing the layoffs and the rehires, there aren't any restrictions. Okay. All right. Let's see what else we had here. Um, how will we know when to apply for some of this relief? Well, if you're talking about the two paid leave programs, um, keep in mind that under the new guidance, you have a tax credit and the IRS has already told us how you can redeem or utilize those tax credits. So that would be the answer on that. Unemployment, go out and apply. As to whatever's coming down the pike on the stimulus package, we don't even know what those are, so we don't know how you would apply yet. Okay. Um, Carrie Ortiz asked, and we did talk a little bit about this, Carrie, but she said, does the waiting period um, for these benefits start April 1st? Is there a credit for that time already spent? And at this point, we don't know of any kind of credit for this weird in-between time. Yeah, what we do know under the DOL guidance that they issued yesterday or the FAQs is that you don't get credit. So this new law does not apply to anything you're doing previous. So if you're today are paying out PTO, you don't get to go on April 1st and try to claim a tax credit for what you're doing today. We know that that's the case. We don't know if there's going to be some additional federal funding to help cover the PTO that you're paying today. And there's one in here that I do want to cover. Yeah. And that is, is the governor's order and the executive order 2012, does that trigger the uh, eligibility under the Pay the emergency paid sick leave act, and I think it does because it's a quarantine act. It's an isolation act, right? Isolation order. Well, I guess I read that to say when when the order says it's subject to quarantine orders, I, I think they've been careful not to say that this is that people are required to stay home. Um, so it's it's not a whatever they're referring to in terms of like stay in place. Um, and so I read that to basically say that you are permitted to stay open, for example, your employees are permitted to work at work subject to an order that they have that they cannot because they have COVID-19 or whatever. But I, Except for the businesses located, the businesses listed in paragraph two, those are the ones that are forbidden, that are told that they had to close immediately. I think that those are triggered, those trigger coverage under the paid sick leave. I guess we should have rehearsed this. <laughs> we'll let Andy read up on that one. Um, oh, yeah. So, right, 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 right. Yeah, I, th I thought it was in the context of the businesses are still open. No. That's an individualized right. decision. Right. So, so going to the, so the question asked was, does the governor's order that was issued, whenever that was issued, does that trigger the entitlement to paid leave under the emergency paid sick leave act? And I would say yes, to the extent your business was required to close. Yes. Okay. And then as to those businesses that were required to close from a prior order, which is the restaurants and those groups, yes, because they were required to close. But if your business is entitled or currently entitled to stay open, no. Right. Okay. 
Letty says, if an employer takes precaution to send a sick employee home per CDC guidelines, they can return after 72 hours if no symptoms. Does this qualify for paid federal leave even if they do not seek medical help? Um, the, the paid sick leave, I believe the answer to that is no. I'd have to look at the law itself, but, but in order for the employee to be eligible, they have to be home for symptoms and seeking a medical diagnosis or have been self-quarantined by their physician, by their healthcare yeah. provider. Yeah, there has to be some, they're, they're either seeking medical guidance or they've received it. Okay. Are landscapers considered retail? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, let me look into that. We might be able to look up the NAICS codes to see where landscapers are, and that might help us understand better if that's under retail. Um, I'll keep Maybe it it's more of a service than a good, but I don't know that. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like, you know, when you look at the categories that are listed, it, it, it doesn't, it's not obvious that it falls within one of those. Um, and one would think there's, there's minimal customer contact for a landscaping service, which again, going back to the purpose of this, is to avoid contact with people. Yeah, Robert, uh, and to reach it. Go ahead. Robert Killen um, from Lane SBDC just said, uh, landscapers are aligned with contractors. So okay. his interpretation is that they are not aligned with retailers. Um, let's see, so can we get the tax credit for employees who are working part-time? Yeah, so in terms of sick leave and, and family leave, yes. It, it applies to all employees. The rate that they get paid depends on whether they're part-time or full-time, but all employees are covered. But can I just, at point of clarification, are they saying that they were part-time before they are unable to work, or are they saying that they are reduced down to part-time so they're still working. I think the answer is different. Yeah, I assumed it's they're still working and they take the leave. Yeah, but not that their hours were reduced and so they're now working at a reduced scale and they want to use the... Oh, leave. right, yeah. Okay. Right, right. Yeah, they don't get it just because they've gone from full-time to part-time. They get it because they have a qualifying reason, meaning they're off work. Okay. Um, let's see. And I know we had a wrap up here just to confirm employers are responsible for 12 weeks of leave for a total of about $15,000 of benefits. Only if the employee is unable to work or telecommute because the employee has a child home, a minor child home because the school is closed, the daycare is closed, or there is an unavailable child care provider. Well, and it's not 15,000, it's 12. Because 12, under the family, so starting with the paid sick leave, remember there are two categories of pay. And if it's because they are absent from work because of a, a child care closure or a school closure, the pay is ca capped at 200 a day for two weeks, that's 2,000 bucks. And then under the Family Leave Act, which is only limited to child care closures and school closures, the cap is a total of 10,000. So your worst case scenario is your out of pocket $12,000. Okay. Someone says, um, we have an employee who has chronic health conditions and we are wondering if that will trigger her access to the FMLA and or emergency sick leave. The employee should contact the healthcare provider and get advice to self quarantine. And if the employee does that, then yes, the employee would be eligible. Okay, thank you. Um, someone says, can staff use the EFMLA for reduced hours, like the example that I gave, where they're working part time and then have uh, fewer hours, and the employer apply for the work share program, essentially double dipping to try and get covered in full? Well, they're not going to qualify for the work share program unless they have a drop in their income. So if the employee okay. is getting paid, then they didn't have a drop in the income, so they wouldn't qualify. Okay. Thank you. All right. I think that we, um, someone says, just a heads up, it looks like the postings for FFCRA are available now on the Department of Labor website. So there's that okay. heads up. Right. Okay, so we're going to capture all these questions that were asked here. Um, 
and we'll, um, my staff will kind of watch back through the webinar to try and document the questions as best as possible and the answers that we were able to give and then figure out which ones we couldn't answer um, so we can uh, try to get those questions um, looked up and answered for everybody. So um, thank you to Andy and Amanda. I really appreciate the time that you guys put into this. I know that uh, I'm not sure that this made a whole lot more things a whole lot more clear for folks. Um, this is obviously, um, we're all treading water at this point and we're all trying to just follow along as best as we can. Uh, the chamber, uh, my staff are working around the clock to try and try and organize and, and kind of clarify as much information and get it in one place so folks can access it. The chamber has um, a page uh, on our website that's dedicated just to resources around the COVID-19 situation. We are recording all these webinars. They'll be up on our website. Um, so for folks who want to rewatch it or if you weren't able to watch it or you want to send it to somebody else, those will be up there as well. So I really appreciate everybody's time and um, please reach out to the chamber if there's anything that we can do for you as an employee, as an employer. Um, we just want to be here for you guys. So any final words, Andy and Amanda? No, if you could hold off on posting the document, we'll correct the April 2 date to April 1. So everybody has that. Yeah. So I'll wait to get that from you and then we'll, we'll send it out to folks and get it up. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.